The Bedside Swallow Evaluation, What Should Be Included, Part 2. The Bedside Swallow Evaluation, also known as the Clinical Swallow Evaluation, is a critical first step when it comes to assessing swallow function and formulating a solid plan of care. So important that I wanted to do a Part 2 episode dedicated to this topic. If you haven't checked out part one yet, you can tap the link below to hop right over to that video and review that first before diving into part two. In part two, we're going to look at specific tools that should and maybe shouldn't be included. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. A lot of clinicians may include a finger pulse ox during PO trials, or if the patient is already hooked up to a monitor, the SLP might keep an eye on oxygen saturation levels. But why? Is there a particular number SLPs need to be on the lookout for to suspect possible aspiration? Let's look into oxygen levels during bedside swallow evaluations and see what they can mean. Some old literature has suggested that a dip in oxygen saturation levels by 2% or greater during PO trials could indicate aspiration. However, other literature shows this to be inconclusive or not as sensitive as we thought when it comes to detecting aspiration. For example, a paper published in 2017 by Marion and colleagues used fees while assessing this hypothesis with stroke patients and found that measurements of oxygen desaturation is not a suitable screening tool for the detection of aspiration in stroke patients. So should we still look at oxygen saturation numbers? Yes, we must look at the whole picture, not just numbers and not just subjective complaints or reports. If the patient's oxygen level is much lower than usual, and you can see the patient is using more effort to breathe or looks fatigued, then we need to make sure we alert the nurse. If the body has to choose between breathing and eating, breathing will always win. So we shouldn't be trying to force the patient to eat or drink if their lungs and body require greater effort and attention to breathing. It should also be noted that some patients, like patients with COPD, may have a lower norm when it comes to oxygen saturation. For example, someone with COPD might normally stat at 92%, and they shouldn't be without food and liquid because of that. If patients with COPD who normally sit at a lower oxygen saturation level receive too much supplemental oxygen to get them to 98% or 100% saturation, for example, they could actually go into a hypercapnic respiratory failure where carbon dioxide levels are elevated too high. That's a discussion for a later episode, but just be aware that overall, you should speak with a nurse prior to seeing your patient for their swallow evaluation or treatment session to know what their typical O2 saturation level is and whether or not they require supplemental oxygen to maintain that. A colleague of mine shared a story where she evaluated a patient swallow at bedside as she was recovering from pneumonia. She was very deconditioned at that time and any amount of effort or excursion would usually get this patient out of breath. Their endurance was very low. As my colleague assessed the patient swallowed during liquid and solid PO trials, she noticed the oxygen levels would dip down only while chewing and eating. She realized the patient was holding her breath while she was chewing and tried to maintain that breath hold until after she swallowed. This led to some pretty rapid fatigue and several breaks for the patient to catch her breath. My colleague took the time to educate her patient on strategies to reduce the workload during chewing and swallowing taking breathing breaks as needed, and educated the patient on the breathe-swallow-breathe pattern to improve awareness. She didn't assume the drops in O2 were from aspiration, which in some cases could lead to unnecessary thickening of liquids, but she still paid attention to the oxygen numbers as she took inventory of the entire body as the patient was eating or drinking which gave her very valuable information. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about the bedside swallow evaluation? 
Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. While oxygen numbers and vital signs can provide important data to tie into the whole patient picture, another source of data to bring into your bedside swallow evaluation is lab values. I mentioned this in my bedside swallow evaluation part one video, but I'd like to highlight one lab value in particular that may not be as commonly discussed, procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is a biomarker that's released in response to bacterial infections. For physicians, this could be used as a tool to guide appropriate antibiotic recommendations. At one point, it was thought that procalcitonin could be used as a diagnostic tool to differentiate aspiration pneumonia from aspiration pneumonitis. Pneumonitis meaning inflammation of the lungs from aspirating acidic content like acid reflux or vomit. However, studies have found that this biomarker is not, in fact, a reliable diagnostic tool when it comes to differentiating these two diagnoses. So what could an SLP possibly do with this information? While this is not a routinely ordered lab, procalcitonin can help us get a better idea of how sick our patients are overall. If we have a better understanding of how sick our patients are, that can help us guide our critical thinking when it comes to building a plan. Let's say you have a patient with an active infection and their procalcitonin level is high. You could consider this when deciding whether or not the patient should remain NPO or eat nothing by mouth until they complete an instrumental exam. They may be less likely to tolerate aspiration events as well as someone who doesn't have an active infection, for example. So this could be a justification for holding off on foods and liquids until that instrumental exam can be completed if possible. Tying in lab values and vital signs are important aspects of the bedside swallow evaluation. It should be noted, however, that SLPs shouldn't use lab values alone to make diet recommendations. The best way to truly make a sound diet recommendation is by getting that instrumental swallow evaluation and tying in those findings with the whole picture. As with everything else, this lab value is just a small piece of the puzzle, but an important piece nonetheless. In the MedSLP Collective private community, one SLP posted an important question regarding how to approach pushback from colleagues when it came to doing an instrumental swallow exam before thickening liquids. Her colleagues were thickening at bedside pretty regularly. One of her colleagues responded by telling her she used procalcitonin to justify her diet recommendations at bedside. I want to highlight this story because it's an example of what SLP shouldn't be relying on when it comes to recommending diet textures and consistencies. This turned into a very lively and supportive discussion within the group on how to support your rationale for not recommending thickened liquids at bedside without an instrumental, and also what procalcitonin can and cannot tell us. It provided several examples of how lab values can guide parts of decision making, but of course, lab values don't make up the entire map. Motivational and ethnographic interviewing. We can collect all of the clinical data we want, but one of the most important things we need to bring to the table as clinicians to every single patient is empathy and cultural awareness. And part of that lies in which questions we ask and how we understand our patients. Understanding your patient's goals, preferences, values, and practices are all key components to any assessment. And with food being such a rich part of many cultures, we need to consider all of this during swallow assessments and treatment sessions. Ethnographic interviewing is an interviewing style that looks more at each person's personal perspective. For example, instead of saying, what concerns do you have? You could say, how would you describe what you experience when you have trouble eating? This keeps the question clear and specific to difficulty with eating, but opens the floor for the patient to speak from their lived experiences instead of trying to just rattle off symptoms. Other examples might include, are you comfortable if I begin our session now? Or do you prefer to have family present? Remember, healthcare professionals aren't always trusted. Another piece of advice that I received and will never forget is to actually take time to sit down next to your patient instead of towering over them. 
This can create a sense of superiority or power imbalance when really we need to give our patients the space they need while keeping our roles balanced. We're here to help them with their goals, not push our goals. There's an excellent article in ASHA titled Asking the Right Questions in the Right Ways, written by Carol Westby, Angela Berta, and Zarin Mehta, that goes over strategies for ethnographic interviewing. Some of their examples of structured prompts include, tell me about a typical mealtime, or tell me about a typical day. Overall, these types of questions allow clinicians to gain a better understanding of the daily environments and social situations that patients and their family members experience and how they understand those situations. Motivational interviewing is another important tool for SLPs to bring to their assessments. This helps us figure out our patients' life participation goals and establishes a culture for patients as co-collaborators in treatment planning. According to Miller and Rolnick, this is a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. Essentially, this sets up our assessments and treatment sessions as a captain and co-captain situation instead of a clinician and patient scenario. There are four key skills for motivational interviewing. Open-ended questions, affirming your patient's strengths, Reflecting your patient's statements back to them is a method of making an informed guess about what your patient is communicating, and summarizing the whole conversation or topic to reduce confusion or ambiguity. Inside of the MetaSLP Collective, we have a wonderful resource and webinar dedicated to motivational interviewing provided by Valeria Gary, who is a medical SLP and an ACE certified behavior change specialist. One colleague shared a story with me about how bringing in ethnographic interviewing and mindfully incorporating cultural considerations into her daily practice impacted several of her treatment plans. One of her patients who was visiting from Japan described her daily experience with food and liquids to my colleague, and an important part of that discussion involved hot tea. Her priority was to drink hot liquids in therapy, not the ice water that my colleague usually brought into patients' rooms. Another patient she saw believed that drinking cold water in the morning would make him sick, so she made sure to arrange all of their dysphagia therapy sessions in the afternoon when it was appropriate for him to have cold liquids. She was a travel therapist, so she found herself learning a variety of cultural differences and felt more prepared to prioritize those in her initial interview process to better serve her patients as a co-captain in their treatment planning. We've got a free gift for you over at metaslpcollective.com. You'll get instant access to our free MetaSLP Collective clipboard kit, which includes our clinical swallow examination resource. We also have a robust and vibrant community of SLPs and mentors to help you out with your toughest clinical cases. Head over to metaslpcollective.com now to get your hands on this. The link will be in the description below.